So you could start with Maxwell Rayleigh arrow pointing upwards, right? No smoking smoke detectors at all. Um, it's ironic given how many cigars I have as well. Um, so this is already part of the high tech uh, design that Maxwell insisted on for the new lab. The reason he needed this tower, right, which is very high, was because initially he needed very high vacuum. He needed a device to produce very, very low air, air pressures. And one way to do that was if you didn't have a pump, which were just coming on stream in the 1870s, especially Sprengel pumps, what you could do was to draw immensely long, vertical, very thin glass capillary tubes and fill them with mercury. And then as the mercury drops, you're producing a workable, um, ev evacuated space right at the top of the tower. And a lot of the experiments that were done in the 1880s and onwards needed very, very low pressure, very high vacuum. And this set of devices, these pumps with their very long, thin glass capillary tubes were installed here. And then rather quickly it was replaced by this splendid lift shaft. Okay, let's, let's Cavendish was, of course, one needs to emphasise this, not the first university physics lab in Britain. Uh, there's an enormous controversy about which the first university physics lab was. It was either a disused wine cellar in Glasgow, which was in the basement of the old college in Glasgow, which was run by William Thompson, later Kelvin, or possibly the um, Clarendon Laboratory in Oxford, which opened just before the Cavendish. But what was extraordinary about this building was that it was purpose-built. It was not um, adapted and improvised from previous structures. So one sees here the kind of demands and expectations built in brick and mortar and stone that Maxwell and his colleagues imagined you needed. You needed a lecture theatre, which was going to be well equipped with enough apparatus to um, not just demonstrate electromagnetic and optical and chemical phenomena to the students, but actually potentially to get them involved in performing their own experiments, so that they would move between the lecture theatre and the labs beyond. And that was really a radical new idea. It's also important, I think, to remember that um, the emphasis on research is new. In the 1860s and 70s, it wasn't obvious that the university, a place like Cambridge, should sponsor research. That was a new idea, very new. Um, it was much associated with what was thought of as the German model of experimental sciences. Um, embodied perhaps best in the new Physics Institute in Berlin, which opened in the same year, 1871, uh, run by Hermann von Helmholtz, the greatest of the German physicists. And um, for Maxwell, that German model was definitely an inspiration. Indeed, Helmholtz had been offered the job of running the Cavendish before Maxwell had, and turned it down because he didn't want to leave Germany. So let's look at the lecture theatre. So this is the Maxwell Lecture Theatre. It's been adapted and changed quite a bit um, since the 1870s, but you see the kind of layout that such a lecture theatre involved. It's a very high 
room. It has an extremely beautiful um, wooden ceiling. Um, you see as well the ways in which the theatre could be darkened with the windows, the very high windows which um, Maxwell insisted on for illumination, the window platforms to bring sunlight uh, for experimental purposes into the lab. Um, the uh, very, and this is all obviously uh, 20th century, not um, 19th century technology, but it gives you an idea of the sort of equipment. And again, one has to realize how radical and new this kind of material was. It also gives you a sense of the size of the class of students. Right? Um, the university in the 1870s and 80s was still pretty small. And Maxwell's classes were relatively tiny by our standards. But his lectures, especially to beginning undergraduates, um, initially attracted quite large numbers of students. They didn't stay. Maxwell was a terrible undergraduate lecturer. Uh, everyone says so. Um, he would uh, wander off on lines of his own interest. He would stand with his back to the students and write on the blackboard. Um, he would sort of stand there in a daze for a bit and then return to uh, the lecture and so on. He was a terrible teacher, but he was clearly an inspirational presence. And it's, I think it tells us something about the, the relationship between the teaching and the research imperatives. I mean, he was much better at inspiring research projects than at teaching anybody anything. Right? I think very few people learned anything from being taught by Maxwell, and lots of people learned a lot by reading him. I've never worked out why there are two clocks here. <laughs> only, only one of which ever worked. <laughs> it doesn't seem big people. Mm -hmm. What else is there? There are other lecture theatres. There's Rayleigh and so on, but it's much the same. Mm -hmm. This second entrance to the lecture theatre, which is designed for students who arrived late so that they wouldn't be humiliated by coming in the front. But the wood is so creaky that if you do arrive late, I know this because I've lectured in this room, if you do arrive late, it's deafening, right? <laughs> you can actually hear people you know, doing that. So that although the system was, was designed to spare people's blushes, the fact of the matter is that it doesn't work. Well. I'm the only one. I once lectured here. Very strange place. Also, Ernest Gellner, the anthropologist, when he came back from the Soviet Union, gave his lecture, famous lecture here, absolutely crowded out on the fall of the communist system.